Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to fiscal 2019 preliminary budget hearing. I am Rafael Espinal. I am the chair of the City Council's Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. This morning, we will be reviewing the Department of Consumer Affairs fiscal year 2019 preliminary budget. Specifically, we will be assessing DCA's programs and activities to ensure that the agency is serving the public in a financially responsible way. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge and welcome my colleagues to our first DCA hearing of the year and new members to the committee, uh, Councilmember Margaret Chin from Manhattan and Councilman Peter Koo from Queens. The Mayor's fiscal 2019 preliminary budget for the Department of Consumer Affairs is $40.9 million, including $27 million in personal services funding to support 439 budgeted full-time positions. This funding will support the agency's efforts to resolve consumer complaints, issue various licenses, educate and protect consumers, and ensure that businesses comply with local and state laws. In a few minutes, we will hear more from DCA Commissioner Laura Lay Salas regarding how the department intends to use the funding it has been allocated in more detail. In our discussion with DCA this morning, I hope to explore different areas of the budget in order to gain clarity and transparency on where and how money is being spent to protect consumers, create financial empowerment for New Yorkers, educate businesses, and maintain high standards for employee rights in New York City. In particular, I look forward to hearing more from DCA regarding its budget realignment within its adjudication unit and review the plans for implementation. Additionally, I'd like to examine DCA's reporting in the PMMR to gain a better perspective on how well aligned their budget is with their performance. After we hear from the Department of Consumer Affairs, members will have a chance to follow up with questions for the commissioner. After that, members of the public will have an opportunity to provide testimony for the committee, which I hope the commissioner or the members of her staff will stay and listen to. I look forward to working with the agency and all other interested parties in finalizing the budget over the following few months. In closing, I want to thank my staff for working to put this hearing together, including a Andrew Wilbur, John Russell, Nathan Toth, Valkis Mirig, and I would like to thank, now ask the committee council to please swear in the commissioner. Please you raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and answer uh, council member questions honestly? I do. Thank you. Yeah, you may begin, Commissioner. Good morning, Chair Espinal and members of the Committee of Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. My name is Lorelei Salas, and I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Consumer Affairs. I would like to take this opportunity today to congratulate both the new and returning members of this important committee. Chair Espinal, I look forward to continuing our successful partnership in this new session. And Council Members Chin and Ku, I look forward to working with all of you uh, to protect consumers and workers and educate businesses in your districts and across New York City. I am joined today by some of my colleagues at DCA and they might help me answer some of your questions later. DCA's mission is to protect and enhance the daily economic lives of New Yorkers to create thriving communities. We do this by licensing more than 81,000 businesses across more than 50 industries and enforcing key consumer protection, licensing, and workplace laws that apply to countless more. Today, I will share with you some of DCA's major successes for New Yorkers over the past year and show you where the agency plans to go in 2018. In last year's testimony, I shared the story of Rhoda Branch, a New Yorker who came to DCA for help when she was taken advantage of by a used car dealer. We were able to get Rhoda $4,800 in restitution, which helped her repair the car she needed to get to work and take care of her family. This year, I'd like to start with the story of thousands of small business owners across New York striving to succeed in what they know is the greatest city on earth in the face of high rents, high expenses, and what feels like lots of rules to follow. DCA enforces some of those rules, and we wanted to find a way to help small businesses understand and comply with the law while preserving and enforcing all the protections it affords consumers and workers. Very good, he's understandable. He's, uh, he taught me like a lot of understandable things and things that's gonna keep my business running. I mean, there's a lot of things that he teach me. Flavors is one thing. Second things is like uh, anything, if you sell anything like loose singles, you have to sell it $3 and up. Uh, the stamp on the cigarettes, <laughs> and uh, the packs, like uh, everything has to be sealed. 
Yeah, I think it would be very helpful for our small business. You know, small business means, I mean, sometimes we, we, we don't know everything. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we will make a, some mistake. It doesn't mean, you know, I, I want that, you know, I just don't know that. That's, uh, that problem will be good, you know. The Visiting Inspector Program, or VIP, is an exciting new initiative to educate small businesses about city laws and rules through free, no-fine inspections. Under VIP, new brick-and-mortar licensees can schedule these inspections within three months of receiving their license. At, v at a VIP inspection, a senior DCA inspector will educate the business about how to comply with the laws and rules DCA enforces and identify any potential violations for the business to fix before their first official inspection. VIP inspections for the, um, are conducted in the business's language of choice. More than 3,500 businesses, from tobacco retail dealers to sidewalk cafes to retail laundries, receive a new license from DCA each year. VIP helps these small businesses understand the law and fix problems before they receive fines. This program is an important part of Mayor de Blasio's continuing commitment to reduce fines on small businesses. In addition to VIP, DCA continues to improve and expand our efforts to educate businesses about their obligations through direct outreach and engagement. In 2017, DCA held open houses for cigarette retail dealers and laundry businesses affected by recent changes in the law. These events gave businesses the chance to talk directly to DCA staff about how new requirements would affect their business and submit questions for the agency to answer. More than 260 businesses attended these sessions, which were held across the five boroughs and included live interpretation into languages other than English. Over the past year, DCA's outreach team conducted 21 business education days, during which we visited almost 1,800 businesses. When DCA holds a business education day, we invite the local council member, merchant associations, or business improvement districts, as well as representatives from the departments of small business services and sanitation. We've made it a priority to listen to business owners and create new venues for them to talk to DCA in a friendly, informal setting. Last fall, DCA held a small business roundtable in Sunset Park with business owners, community leaders, and merchant associations as part of Mayor de Blasio's City Hall in Your Borough series in Brooklyn. The event was a unique opportunity for business owners to bring their challenges and suggestions directly to me I deeply appreciated the attendees' thoughtful feedback on how the city could better support businesses like theirs and was impressed by the sense of responsibility they felt for the well-being of consumers and workers in their communities. Last month, I held another roundtable for businesses in Southeast Queens in partnership with Council Member Danique Miller, and I look forward to holding more roundtables in other communities across the city. Over the past year, DCA has taken aggressive action to protect consumers and workers and hold businesses who wrong them accountable. When I testified before you last year, I identified predatory lending by used car dealers as a major problem for consumers like Rhoda Branch and a primary target for DCA. I am proud to say that DCA and the council have worked together to notch several important accomplishments in this area. In October, Mayor de Blasio signed local laws 197 and 198. These laws, introduced by Chair Espinal and former council member Dan Garotnik, expand protections for consumers who buy used cars and combat predatory sales and financing practices in the used car industry. During the development of these bills, which started with a public hearing I co-led with Chair Espinal in 2016, DCA heard from many consumers that they were rushed into purchases and loans they later regretted using high-pressure sales tactics. Because of these laws, many consumers will, for the first time, be offered the option to review and think over a contract for a reasonable per period of time before taking the car home. Common predatory practices like price packing contracts by sleeping in expensive add-ons or accessories are now prohibited. The passage of these laws 
is a major accomplishment for consumers and I commend the committee for its hard work and wise judgment in making this happen. Public awareness is an important tool in DCA's efforts to protect consumers. Our multi-pronged approach to educating the public about predatory lending in the used car industry included a steady flow of press announcements about enforcement and legislative milestones in a campaign to arm current and prospective used car owners with the knowledge they need to avoid predatory practices. DCA's multilingual campaign ads run on targeted bus shelters, telephone kiosks, and Link NYC towers, as well as in community and ethnic newspapers on radio and online. DCA's robust public awareness efforts are proof of our commitment to educating consumers and workers across all media and in ways that are accessible to every community. DCA's Office of the General Counsel also scored major victories for consumers in court and at the negotiating table. In March, we announced charges against the used car dealership Major World, a case that is still underway at the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings. In November, we announced a settlement agreement with three financing companies that engaged in deceptive and unlawful trade practices in connection with subprime auto loans offered through used car dealerships. That settlement secured almost $400,000 for 50 consumers who were given high interest loans and opened the door for more consumers to come forward and claim restitution. When DCA learned that the group A New Beginning for Immigrant Rights and its president, Carlos Davila, were charging immigrant New Yorkers up to $200 for an identification card they falsely claimed would protect buyers from immigration enforcement agents, we took action. Cases like these send a strong message. Businesses who scam, deceive, or steer consumers into predatory loans will be held to account. DCA regularly develops multilingual educational materials covering key issues and laws, and we actively pursue paid and earned media opportunities to educate New Yorkers about their rights as consumers and workers, the services DCA provides, and the best ways to protect themselves from predatory conduct. When the Equifax data breach was revealed, we alerted consumers to steps they could take to protect their identities. We warned immigrant New Yorkers about predatory providers that lure people in with false promises of an easy 10-year visa, without disclosing that applicants must satisfy several strict conditions and place themselves in deportation proceedings to qualify for the benefit. One of our major initiatives was a series of presentations to educate the public about predatory lending and provide strategies for identifying and avoiding it. DCA reached almost 4,000 New Yorkers through 95 community center presentations across the city. At these events, which took place at neighborhood gatherings, places of worship, and community board meetings, we had the opportunity to hear directly from consumers and workers about what was affecting them, their friends, their families, and their communities. Through these events and others, we've heard a lot from consumers and workers. Fast food and retail workers told us how unpredictable schedules make it hard to save and plan for the future. Clients at our financial empowerment centers told us how unstable costs and income make it hard to get a handle on household finances and drive families to turn to costly alternative financial services to make ends meet. A theme that resonated in both the personal stories of New Yorkers and emerging economic research is income volatility. DCA hopes to be able to use the tools at our disposal to help New Yorkers cope with and overcome income volatility. Your income is volatile if the amount you take home increases or decreases by 25% or more from one month to the next. A volatile income can make it hard for families to plan and save for the future and present a host of other challenges. Families with volatile incomes are more likely to experience food insecurity, delay important spending like bill payments, and use alternative financial services. Without a sense of how much money is coming in each month, families cannot budget or plan for their futures. Income volatility is a big problem with many causes and many potential solutions. In the year ahead, helping New Yorkers experiencing income volatility will be a critical element of DCA's decision-making process. We want to ask ourselves whether and how we can integrate methods for reducing income volatility into all parts of DCA's existing work 
and develop new programs and initiatives helpful to New Yorkers experiencing income volatility. In some cases, we found that executing and expanding on what we already do is the best way to combat income volatility. That is certainly the case with ECA's popular NYC free tax prep program. I will let some of the New Yorkers who are using the program this year tell you about their experiences. I paid up to $150 to get my taxes done, and I wasn't happy with it. Here, I'm not paying anything, and I feel very safe and comfortable in getting it done. These people are professionals and know about accounting and taxes for a living, versus me, I'm just a kind of a layman's person when it comes to tax. So I imagine that this process will be a bit easier than kind of doing it on my own like I usually do. I've been going to get my taxes free for four years, because some people can afford to do this. You know, if they go to other places where they get charged for it, over here is free. Since 2015, when the de Blasio administration made its first investment in the program, more than 425,000 returns have been filed quickly, safely, and without charge using NYC free tax prep services. These services have brought more than $500 million in refunds and tax preparer fee savings to hardworking New Yorkers. This important program is just one piece of DCA's Office of Financial Empowerment's approach to helping New Yorkers with low or volatile incomes. With the help of our community partners, OFE maintains more than 20 financial empowerment centers across the five boroughs. OFE's financial empowerment centers help New Yorkers tackle debt, save for the future, open a bank account, improve credit, and take charge of their financial futures. In 2017, OFE's financial counseling programs provided almost 15,500 free one-on-one -on -one financial counseling sessions to almost 9,300 New Yorkers. Earlier this year, Mayor de Blasio announced the launch of Empowered NYC, a new initiative to strengthen the health of New Yorkers with disabilities by testing, adopting, and promoting new financial empowerment strategies focused on the specific needs of individuals with disabilities living across the five boroughs. OFE also leverages its in-house expertise and partnerships with outside experts and advocates to produce research and analysis on the issues that matter most to the financial health of New Yorkers. In December, DCA released student loan borrowing across New York City neighborhoods, the first neighborhood level examination of student loan outcomes in New York City. The report found that although New Yorkers on average have student loan delinquency and default rates that are slightly lower than the national average, certain neighborhoods experience significantly higher rates despite low overall loan balances. OFE launched targeted student loan clinics in these neighborhoods in January, a key illustration of how OFE's research and analysis can drive issue conversations forward and spur the development of creative initiatives to help New Yorkers in the ways they need most. Also in December, we released How Neighborhood Help New Yorkers Get Ahead, and I believe some of these reports are included in your packets. This is a report of findings from the Collaborative for Neighborhood Financial Health, a partnership between OFE, the New Economy Project, and the Bedford Stubbs and Restoration Corporation, aimed at understanding how neighborhoods impact residents' financial health and stability. The report made key findings about how the resources, services, and opportunities a neighborhood provides can shape the financial futures of its residents. We look forward to using these data to inform further outreach and targeted initiatives to pioneer new approaches for helping residents and neighborhoods thrive financially. This thoughtful strategic approach also guides the work of DCA's other divisions, including the Office of Labor Policy and Standards. Over the past year, DCA's Office of Labor Policy and Standards has overseen the implementation of groundbreaking new policies and continue to enforce the key municipal labor laws New Yorkers depend on. In October, months of ground laying work by OLPS, which included conducting outreach to over 1,000 fast food and retail businesses and providing training to about 150 fast food franchise owners to help them prepare for implementation, culminated in Mayor de Blasio's Fair Work Week package of laws going into effect. Because of these laws and the outreach, education, and enforcement work done, by OLPS, 
thousands of fast food and retail workers across New York City will benefit from more stable schedules that allow them to save, plan for their futures, and spend more time with their families. DCA takes its commitment to serve as a central resource for working New Yorkers to assert their rights under the law seriously. In March 2017, OLPS brought together more than 100 home care workers, nannies, caregivers, and house cleaners for the first of several convenings to hear their stories and inform the work of the paid care division. The next month, we convened a public hearing on the state of workers' rights in New York City. Through these forums, we heard from over 200 workers and organizations reflecting the rich diversity that makes our city such a unique and vibrant place. These stories documented some of the extraordinary challenges New Yorkers face just trying to make ends meet. These challenges included wage theft, hazardous conditions, abusive treatment by employers, and of course, volatile wages and compensation. Thanks to the leadership of the City Council and particularly those on this committee, the City's protections now extend beyond those workers who are in traditional employment situations Freelancers, among them writers, editors, artists, photographers, and other workers who make New York City a global capital of arts, entertainment, fashion, and media, all too often face difficulty securing timely and complete payment of the monies they've earned. Under the Freelance Ism Free Act, freelancers in New York City now enjoy first of their kind protections that are not available anywhere else in the nation. Since the law went into effect in May of last year, OLPS has been hard at work educating freelancers about their rights, guiding them through the complaint process, and providing important information about how to pursue claims in court. To date, OLPS has assisted nearly 500 freelancers, 86 of whom have reported payment of a total of over $180,000 in compensation after contacting DCA. OLPS continues to actively enforce key labor laws like paid sick leave and commuter benefits. To date, OLPS has obtained over $7 million in restitution and penalties for almost 23,000 workers whose rights under the paid sick leave law were violated. Hello, Councilmember Lander, how are you? DCA is constantly working to streamline the licensing process for businesses and improve the experience of interacting with the agency both at the licensing window and in the field during an inspection. We're also always looking for ways to refine our consumer mediation process to help consumer and businesses resolve their disputes to mutual benefit. DCA, hello, Council Member Koslowitz. DCA continues to meet or exceed our targets for customer service and mediation. Response times for consumer complaints and licensing requests are prompt. New Yorkers waited less than 10 minutes for service at our licensing center last year, on average, while the agency processed almost 50,000 license or renewal applications. We are also in the process of reviewing our existing license applications and identifying places where we can simplify or eliminate paperwork. We've already reviewed and streamlined applications or renewal packages for 43 of the license categories. DCA's Consumer Services Division, which assists consumers by helping them work out disputes with businesses, resolved almost 1,500 complaints to the satisfaction of both consumers and businesses last year. DCA is committed to deploying all the tools at our disposal to protect and enhance the daily economic lives of New Yorkers. Some of those tools have not been updated uh, since they were created decades ago. Technology and economic behavior change rapidly and government must work diligently to keep pace. The threats to consumers and workers have evolved and DCA's tools should evolve to meet them. In this new session of the council, I look forward to working with this committee to ensure that DCA has the tools we need to protect consumers and workers, hold predatory actors accountable and promote a cult culture of compliance among New York City businesses. Thank you for the opportunity to share some of DCA's successes and tell you about our path toward addressing income volatility and other issues affecting consumers and workers. As always, we look to the City Council as a close partner in these efforts. At DCA, we know that the metrics, indicators, and dollar figures we bring to the City Council are important, but that's not how we ultimately measure our success. Instead, we find our success in the stories of the New Yorkers who are able to help 
the fast food worker who can start planning to finish her degree at night because her schedule is more stable, the struggling young person who learns how to manage his student loans, get his taxes in order, and finally begins to see a path toward taking charge of his financial future. The bodega owner who needs help understanding the law, not a violation for failing to grasp it. To us, these stories are the measures of success. Thank you so much for listening to us today, and I will be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. We have been joined by Karen Koslowitz from Queens and Brad Lander, who danced and snapped his finger on, into the hearing. I'm glad we repealed the cabaret law, otherwise we would have been cited by DCA for uh, <laughs> the dancing. But um, I want to uh, give my colleagues a chance to ask questions if they have any before I, I ask any questions. Margaret. Thank you, Chair, and it's a pleasure to be on this committee, and uh, thank you, Commissioner, for your uh, testimony. And it's really wonderful to hear um, all the successes from uh, DCA, really educating our you know, small businesses owner and doing a lot to help um, consumer, and I think that the council, we are very proud of the legislation that we have passed. Uh, when you talk about those you know, second, and car dealership affects all the immigrant community across the city, and we're really happy that um, the success that you have been able to accomplish. And of course, freelancer, uh, that we're able to provide the protection and basic leave, um, but we still got a way to go. Um, the, the question I have is that, you know, DCA's budget is very small. It's almost as small as the Department for the Aging. <laughs> um, but these are important agency that provides a very vital uh, service. And I just wanted to make sure, I mean, do you think you have enough um, staff to really go out and do the education and then also the enforcement? Because one of the issue in my district, I know that when we were, um, it's a social adult daycare. And when we were um, working on the legislation, we try to get DCA as the agency uh, to do this oversight, and that didn't happen. Um, the only way that consumer can complain about uh, a social adult daycare um, mm -hmm. that are not providing uh, good services is through complaint through DIFTA. And the, the reason we've heard a lot is, oh, it's, it's governed by the state, but mm -hmm. these organizations are operating in the city, and I really see a role for Department of Consumer Affairs, because these are our consumers. And they're using um, government benefit because they only accept uh, seniors um, who have Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And if a senior has Medicare, they go there and they get rejected. Um, so a senior oftentimes comes to our office and was complaining, well, I'm a senior, I, I want to be able to take advantage of the service, or I need the service, but I, I can get it because I, I don't have Medicaid. That's one issue. And all of a sudden, we have seen more social adult daycare established in the city than senior center. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have about 255 senior center. We have more than 300 social adult daycare mm -hmm. that are registered um, with the Department for the Aging. So I think that's something that I, I would love to work with DCA and on this committee to see how we can provide the protection to our senior and making sure we also protect government benefit. Because these social adult daycare are supposed to help seniors who are more vulnerable. But the stories that we're getting and hearing uh, from the community is they're not doing that. Um, and there are instances where you know they're paying people or giving people coupons and stuff to attract them to come. And so we want to be able to work with DIFTA and then ZCA and figure a way to really bring them in because we do need good social adult daycare because there are a lot of seniors who need this service. And, but the way it is happening now is just not um, doing what it's supposed to do. So I do see a role that uh, DCA can help with that and maybe by having you know, more personnel to be able to help with the enforcement and registration. Um, so maybe you can uh, give me some feedback sure. on that. Yes, thank you. 
So we, we have, um, in the last couple of years, tried to use our existing authority to protect consumers uh, and go into certain areas that in the past maybe we hadn't gone into, like some of the work we're doing now, like um, prosecuting lawyers who are um, coming out with these 10-year visas and deceiving consumers and having them spend thousands of dollars in that is um, an example of the kind of uh, litigation we're engaging in right now. Um, so we'll be happy to sit down with you and explore whether there's anything in our existing authority that allows us to, to do some work here. Um, with respect to the question about resources, we, you know, we, we work with our existing resources. We have, um, we have to prioritize often, and, and we try to prioritize by focusing on areas in which we see the greatest harm to consumers and workers. We also try to uh, coordinate among the different divisions to make sure that we're creating efficiencies and that we have a more impact by using, being very smart about how we use all of our existing resources. Yeah, I think that though for um, outreach and education, you probably could use more resources on that. Um, you know, the multilingual aspect. Um, I think one of the issues is that a lot of the worker might not feel comfortable enough to complain because of fear of retaliation. Because um, the paid sick leave law we've passed. Uh, but I think it's really good to continue to do the education. I mean, the, the program that you had uh, visiting the small business, we did one in my district, and I found that was to be very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and the owners and the manager, they were receptive, and some of them actually know about the law. Mm -hmm. But imagine going through every businesses, I mean, just in Chinatown alone, we have, I think within the bid area, they have more than 2,000 businesses. So it, it's a large number across the city, and to be able to kind of go back and visit them even yearly, it's, it's a lot of resources to be able to do that. But it's necessary. People need to be reminded um, that they need to you know, provide good services and make sure that consumers are protected. We, we definitely believe in making sure that businesses are armed with the right tools and information to, to comply with the laws, right? It helps them, it helps consumers and workers too. So we, we're very supportive of um, expanding outreach operations. Thank you, Chair. And, and council member as well, we should say that uh, because of the chair's bill from a few years ago, we have consumer protection materials specifically targeted towards seniors. And that uh, list a couple of common scams or predatory tactics that are used against seniors because people think they're vulnerable, and in many cases they are. Um, and this material helps to educate them about what resources are available and what they can do to help themselves if they've been the victim of a scam. And so we'll be happy to provide those to your office uh, and thank you to Chair Espinall for that bill. Casey, do you mind um, stating your name for the record? Yes, my name is Casey Adams, BCA. And just quick, just to follow up on that, so how can a senior ac access those documents? Are, are, there, are they distributed to senior centers across the city? So right now, they're, uh, they're distributed in all of our outreach events that we think have a significant chance of having seniors there to receive them. And they are available. They, they can also just be taken uh, down off of our website in multiple languages. We translated them. So people can print them on their own and distribute them. Uh, so we've done a lot of work to make sure that we're reaching out to where we can, uh, oh. where we can get them into seniors' hands. All right, thanks. Brad Lander? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. It's an honor to join, join this committee. I was a frequent guest uh, last term, but I'm glad to be here as a voting member, and your leadership has been uh, has really helped move things forward, and, and Commissioner, you as well. What uh, Obviously, I've focused especially on OLPS with you, but just what you've done with DCA in the last couple of years is, is really extraordinary, and the kind of thing I think people are hungry for from government and, and don't see that much from government. So thanks to both of you. Um, uh, and obviously on some of the, you know, we've given you a lot more to do in the last few years in this committee, and I'm really proud of that, and we see it going around the country. Actually, a colleague of mine in Austin just got paid sick days past there, and they're going to put it on the ballot in Dallas and San Antonio. They're working on it in Westchester, really growing. Philly is having their hearing on Fair Work Week this week, and I know they've checked with your office and, and with ours. It's, it's, a, it's a part of a movement in the city's role. Uh, is central, and then, you know, so adding the Fair Work Week enforcement, of course, adding the freelancers and free enforcement, and thank you so much for those first numbers. Um, it, it looks to me, though, in the budget, like your headcount is flat, so I, I, I want to know what either 
brilliant management you're using or whether we actually need to be looking at giving you the staff to enforce, you know, we, we didn't take away, with the exception of the cabaret law, which I guess maybe you could save a little bit by not having to enforce the cabaret law, but we haven't taken that much off the books in other areas of licensing. So um, what, I mean, maybe if you could just drill down on OLPS, like what is the headcount um, and, uh, and how are you projecting, given your r responsibility increase across this quite significant area of law, which of course I'm fully on board for. I just want to make sure the resources, I mean, in some ways goes to what Councilmember Chin was saying, but with specific focus on OLPS, um, what's the headcount and um, is it sufficient to, to get the growing work done? I want to add to Brad's question uh, because we also noticed that there is a 10% vacancy rate uh, uh, as of December 2017. So if you can also dig into that as well, it would be helpful. Sure, and I, I might get some help from my Director of Budget, Mario Rockville. Um, so let me just say that uh, this, the package of, of, of laws that OLPS enforces is, is extremely critical, right? And we, we believe in it, we, it's part of our mission, um, it's work that we, we really care about, and so we do everything we can to make sure that it receives the attention it needs and is you know, part of the mayor's priority. Th this is not in any way a question of whether you guys care enough about or prioritize this work. It's our job to make sure you have the right resource level yeah. to do the work, and I want to make sure we're doing our job there as well. So the, the division has grown. I mean, we have a 44 uh, headcount now in OLPS. And what has happened is that the agency has self-funded some of those lines because precisely of what you just raised about having that uh, vacancy rate of like around 10% or so. So there is some unused money that we are carrying over from year to year uh, because of the recruitment process and just like those, it takes a long time to actually fill those vacancies sometimes. So we have... Uh, being able to use our own existing funds to add the head to the head count. Um, additional funds are always welcome, obviously, but right now we believe that we have been able to meet our mandates by being very smart and, and stretching everything we can to, to do the work, yeah. All right, so let me ask about one indicator, though, that, that makes me concerned that we might need to provide you more resources, which is the growth in time on the paid sick days complaints. Though the complaints have grown, the numbers you're reviewing has grown, that's good, but it looks like the length of time uh, to resolve them, at least four month actuals in the MMR this year from last year, is about double what it was. So that just jumped out to me as a sign of it, that seems like evidence. And it's just not surprising, given that we've got all these new responsibilities, yes. that you might need some additional inspectors to do that work. Can you, you, I mean, so my assumption is maybe you need more people. If you have different reasons why that's high, I mean, I'd I be think glad to hear it's them. probably a combination of, you know, having like more of a caseload, right, and more laws to enforce. So having to divide up the work among the same staff. But also, um, I would say that some of the investigations, uh, over the first year or two, maybe the investigations were conducted in a faster way because the issues were faster to resolve or the period in which the law was in place was shorter, so it was easier to come to a settlement agreement with businesses. The cases that we're looking at for that period of time where they're taking longer, present some, some of them present more difficult issues, complicated issues, and we're talking about larger cases, so it's harder to you know, arrive at a settlement. But I have to say that we, have, we are committed to going back to having our complaint um, cases, the cases in which we respond to complaints for paid sick leave, uh, to try to keep them within 180 days. That's our goal, and I think we're making great progress towards that, to reducing that, um, you know, like the longer period of time that we used to take uh, for the year that was reported. So we're moving towards going back to 180 days uh, for the time that it takes OLPS to complete an investigation and before the case moves to oath. All right, thank you. Um, and I have a couple more questions, but I guess I'll just note here, and this is in some ways as much for the, the chair and for us, uh, you know, it's the responsibility of the commissioner to say we can do the work with the budget that the mayor has uh, allocated toward us in the preliminary budget. Part of our responsibility, especially in a case where we've added so many responsibilities through laws, is to make sure it really is. So I just think this is an area that we should drill down and 
um, you know, if you, if you need some modest additional headcount to implement all these laws we've passed, we should make sure you have it and that we're therefore not letting those complaint times uh, grow. And I also assume for next year that you'll update the MMR with some indicators for all of these new, uh, all these new laws as well. Paid sick days is in there, but nothing yet on freelancers, on Fair Work Week, on paid care. Yeah, so we are in discussions with the Mayor's Office of Operations to think about what needs to be included for next year, but we're actually right now obviously tracking everything so we can be ready for that. Yeah, and thank yes. you for those, you know, both on the Fair Work Week and, I, you know, I think I was talking to you about, we've heard from the first workers who in fast food now got full-time jobs that they couldn't get before, were stuck in part-time jobs, and thanks to the law, have moved into full-time, which is obviously an enormous thing, and, and getting the new uh, freelance data is really exciting, and I look forward to the first annual report in, in May. Um, uh, two more quick questions. One, I'm, I'm excited to learn about the visiting inspector program. Um, we've been doing some work with Department of Small Business Services and Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities uh, to make sure that small businesses could get more information on compliance with uh, uh, ADA and with accessibility, which is not a law you guys are assigned to enforce, but obviously a critical barrier for a lot of New Yorkers from accessing small business. So does this program, uh, and I, we should have probably looped you into that work, and I don't know whether they did, do the inspectors in this program have some ability to give people the same kind of voluntary advice on how to comply with the ADA and make their new place? You know, there's both questions about what is necessary under the law and what would help make their stores accessible even if they don't necessarily, compliance is not triggered by whatever work they're doing. And if that's not the case, could we work to make it the case? Um, so I, I would just say one thing that um, our when we go, uh, our senior inspectors go to visit a business to educate them on the laws. There are so many, already so many laws and regulations that DCA enforces that we, we spend the time talking about only the, the issues that we enforce, right? Um, I think it's, um, I think it might be for us complicated to actually try to educate them on laws that we do not enforce. You know, we wouldn't want to give them the wrong information. If it's about bringing materials for them, I think that's something we can definitely discuss and consider. Uh, I, I'd be glad to set up a conversation with Commissioner Kalis uh, and with Commissioner Bishop about what they've already done and might be able to yeah. give you. I, I mm -hmm. hear you that we got a lot of laws on the books, um, but partly there are federal laws that folks have to comply with. And, and part of what drove this was that a lot of the small businesses were getting hit with lawsuits. Unfortunately, there are some folks who in the name of the ADA file just tons of lawsuits against small businesses without even having actually really gone to them, and that's what brought this to my attention. But both things are true. We want to protect the businesses from getting hit, and we want to make the venues accessible. So, um, so let's set up that conversation. If there's something we could do to make this program also help people address ADA compliance um, and make their make their Places their their places more accessible. It would be really good. We're to just do. talking about resources. I have like three three inspectors who do this work. So it's you know it's in terms of time and every, it's it's a lot. But I, I'll be happy to sit down and figure out which ways. So I, I hear you. I, I'm going to just push back a little though. We've got we don't have that many places we touch them. Yes. The challenge with the small businesses is they're sitting there. They don't know that they've got this rule in place. They're not focused on the fact that that little lip where there's a step up from the sidewalk to the door, which it's an old building, and so they just rented the space, and they don't know how, it might not be easy to figure out how to put a ramp in, but, yeah. but no one ever comes and tells them about it. And then, and A, then people with, the, with disabilities can't get into their store, but B, they might get hit with a lawsuit, so if we're touching them already, doing something to make them aware. Anyway, we'll, we'll follow uh, up. No, and Casey just reminded me that we do so many outreach events. I think we were like to, like close to a thousand last year that we definitely, those are the times when we can bring additional information with us. And it's not always about talking about the entire the specifics of the law, but it's about bringing the materials with us. All right, we'll, we'll follow up on this. So we'll Thank do that. You. Um, Thank you. Did you, um, I'm not sure if I answered fully the question that you had on the vacancy rate. Um, right, I mean, you, 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 you mentioned that uh, the reason there is a vacancy is because processing times of hiring people, and that's the reason that that, that, that number is there? And, yes, and I would say that actually our vacancy rate is, is, is like smaller now than it was before, right? We, we work hard to make sure that we are um, 
reducing that, that gap. So I think we started with 13%, we're now at 10% maybe. Um, we are, all our vacancies are posted right now. It's just a matter of going through that process, but you know, we are, we're working hard on this. Okay, I also, speaking on, on those numbers, we also noticed that there has been a two million in PS accruals as well, 1.5 because of the adjudication uh, responsibilities to OAF. Is that a number that you're gonna continue seeing moving forward or are you looking to, how are you looking to use those, that two million dollars? Last year, right. Sure, if you're, hi, um, esteemed council members, my name is Mario Rockville Jr. I'm the senior director of finance at DCA. Uh, with respect to the adjudication unit of appropriation, we're actually going through a period of bud PS budget realignment in order to make sure that our budget better reflect our operation. So most of these lines, which relates to settlement and hearing support staff, um, we're actually using them. We just had a restructuring happen mid fiscal year 17, and we're actually in the process of realigning our budget. So once fiscal year 19 starts, you will actually see our budget better reflected, reflect our operational organizational structure. So those accruals are staying in-house and, and the agency is using them to hire new staff? Uh, actually, they're actually already um, in use. It's just that we right. haven't restructured our budget yet. So okay. you're see seeing the money sit in that unit of appropriation, but in-house they're actually being leveraged. And just to also piggyback off of the commissioner when she mentioned our vacancy rate, um, a lot of our um, vacancies are actually posted. And again, the hiring via the civil service um, process, and also some of the hiring freeze has delayed some of our hiring, but our staff are actually pretty aggressive with the hiring process. And actually from uh, fiscal year 2016, our vacancy rate was somewhere about 17% and actually dipped to about 11%, 10%. So we're actually uh, using our resources very efficiently in the agency. Okay, great. Yeah, well, you know, just over the years, we always hear about the lack of enforcement or lack of resources for enforcement, or um, and I just want to make sure that every dollar that the agency's accruing is able, they're able to use it in an efficient way to have uh, those positions filled and the work is being done. So thank you. Uh, up next, we have Karen, uh, Peter Koo from Queens who has a question, then followed by Karen Koslowitz. Thank you, Chair. I'm also very happy to join your committee. I think this is a very exciting committee, and I agree with the slide you have there. Uh, if you shop at the business, on the business, or work at the business, DCA touches your life nearly every day, and it's true. It covers a million people here. So, so I thought your, your, this agency is really understaffed to, you know, to touch life for a million people. Right? So we have to increase your budget and, and, and all these others because I feel you always uh, understand whenever we call you or uh, your agents uh, for some uh, enforcement, you always said, hey, you know, we only have uh, so many people. We have to cover five balls. <laughs> I forgot how many inspectors you have. Uh, 200, 20? Not too many, right? Um, oh. 43. Give me one second, please. 43. We have 43 inspectors, and then we have 11 supervising inspectors. So they're not always in the field because they're supervising staff. You have 14 inspectors? 43 inspectors. Oh, 43. And 11 supervising inspectors. Um, there's an additional three that are dedicated to the visiting inspector program, so those are not enforcing, they're educating. That's, yeah, that's not a lot, okay. So my, my question is, uh, today is not, actually not on the inspectors, eh? uh, Since I became a council member for my district, my biggest problem in my district is stoop lines, you know? Mm -hmm. Because Flushing is a transportation hub, right? Uh, we have uh, so many buses, and the, the, the number seven train, line railroad, all concentrated in the few blocks there in downtown. And, but somehow, you know, there are a lot of stoop lines, you know, pop up um, in front of like, uh, uh, not supermarkets. You know, in the, if a supermarket have a stoop line selling vegetables over, Foods, I can understand that. But there's pop in front of the like, restaurants or herbal stores and, or, or, or other stores, no? But they're selling you know, fruit and vegetables. And they all have licenses, you know? From, so I just wonder how your agency can issue, uh, issue uh, uh, street licenses uh, for those not 
operating as a uh, supermarket or grocery store. No, I can, there are at least three or four. Why at the, inter, uh, at the International Main Street and 41 Avenue um, uh, and, and a few other places? Why in downtown area, therefore? And, and the, the front store is a restaurant, but the side store is a, a well, they have a store line license for vegetables. You know? and it bothers me because uh, when you have store lines, even though they only take three feet, four feet, but if people stand there and pick the apples because it create a obstruction to traffic, pedestrian traffic. People complain, they yell, you know, and then they, they are in a rush to get on the train, you know, and, but they, they, they have to uh, uh, bypass all these people standing on the street and people with a stroller, they, they, women, uh, mothers with two babies, the two strollers there, forget it, you, know, you cannot pass. You have to go out on the, on the, on the street. That's the biggest problem. It's not that I don't understand. Uh, I sympathize people with, like, mm -hmm. they have to sell stuff on the streets, right? It's not easy. If it's cold, it's very cold. If it's hot, it's too hot, right? But the uh, obstruction of tra uh, pedestrian traffic is, 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 is not good for a downtown area. So I hope you, you can look into this and then make sure you don't rubber stand the applications uh, for street line license. And make sure you look at the location and make sure uh, the, uh, it's, it's related to the business. Yeah. There's no way a restaurant can, uh, can apply for a street line license selling vegetables in, in the front or, or other related, um, unrelated business. No? Mm -hmm. So please look into that. Yeah. Yes, I just want to say that uh, I, I know that we, you know, you have a lot of concerns and we've worked together in Flushing to, to observe the conditions there. In terms of our licensing, do you want to say something? Yeah, I think that we, uh, obviously we issue licenses to businesses that uh, fit the requirements of the law. And so I think there's always, there's a mix and Flushing is an example of this. There are other areas like Brighton Beach where we've seen this. There are issues with folks who are unlicensed um, or they're exceeding the bounds of their license because there are strict requirements that they have to abide with with respect to the size of the stands. And we have been um, aggressive in working with the Department of Sanitation and the police department to go out and enforce against those unlicensed stands. So we've done confiscations where we've actually seized all of the food and donated it to City Harvest with the partnership of sanitation and the police department from stands that are um, exceeding the bounds of their licenses and causing really bad problems of congestion. So we've, as the commissioner said, I know that I've worked with your office, she's worked with your office uh, on this issue. We've worked with other council members as well and we're happy to provide whatever resources we can and knowledge about the law um, to the best of our ability. Yeah, because um, they, 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 uh, when I ask people from my office, you know, from pretending they're business owners to, to apply for a store line license on Main Street. Uh, when people uh, on the phone, oh, they, they say, oh, you cannot apply for a, a store line license because it's, this is a, a restricted area or some, something like that. But, uh, but in reality, then well, I was surprised to see the people opening the uh, street line, uh, store line uh, business uh, with a license from Consumer Affairs. Mm -hmm. yeah. My question is just like that. How come they, when people call uh, you, I say, I, I want to apply, uh, the, the people immediately tell them, oh, Main Street or uh, between so, so and so, between these two uh, intersections, uh, restricted area, you cannot apply for a student line license. Yeah. But when, you sub when people submit the paperwork, uh, they get a license. Yeah. So that's the question. You have to look into that. Yeah. I think we're happy to follow up with you to look at these specific cases because obviously if someone is uh, is in an area where they're not allowed to have a stoop line stand license and they're operating one or they have a license, we, we want to look into that right away. So we'll be happy to follow up with you and, and look at those cases. Thank you. Thank you. Coswitz? Thank you. You know, <clears throat> it has always amazed me that DCA is an agency that can bring in a lot of money to the city of New York, and yet through the years your budget has always been low, that you can't do the right job. Certainly not blaming you, because I understand 
that you have always been shortchanged, and it always annoys me to see that. And as a consumer going out there and shopping, you said you had 14 inspectors. Uh, 43. How many? 43. 43. 43. How many are in Queens? Um, we have six in Queens. Six? Six. Oh, oh, sorry. In addition, so that's for generally for all of the industries that we license and inspect. We have a dedicated tobacco unit. So those are inspectors that are only going to tobacco retail dealers. Uh, and for that, we have, which ones are in Queens? Uh, 14, but it's... Uh, we have a couple. Yeah, yeah that, yeah, that couple. unit um, operates in different boroughs, but it's dedicated to tobacco. So, but we can find out, uh, we can look more into how many of them are frequently in Queens and get back to you. Okay, because what I have found, um, <clears throat> I was the chair of Consumer Affairs um, for many years, and I passed many, many laws. And a lot of them, <clears throat> because of the lack of inspectors, I mean, if you have 43 inspectors and Queens has 2.3 million people and lots of stores. I know I represent Forest Hills and Kew Gardens and all along Queens Boulevard, there's nothing but stores. And <clears throat> I have gone shopping in the grocery store and, and not once, not twice in the supermarket and picked up milk that expired three days before the day I'm in the supermarket. And you know what I usually do is I take the milk and I bring it up to the counter and I give it to them. And that's dairy products, a lot of dairy products, whether it be cottage cheese or sour cream, they expired. But many people don't realize that. And they, you know, you want milk and you're in a hurry and you pick up the bottle of milk and you take it home and you don't look at, not everybody looks at the dates, and they pour the milk and they taste it and it's sour. It's no good. So if there were more inspectors out there to look at these stores, certainly I don't want to, you know, uh, burden the businesses, but I think it's the responsibility, actually, of the businesses to make sure that their products that they're selling are up to date, but that doesn't happen. And it really bothers me. And like I said, there's so much money that could be made for the city of New York through D DCA. How many vending licenses do you have now? How many? I'm sorry, how many vending? Vending licenses oh. are out there. Are you referring street to gen vendors, general street. vendors? That's, uh, general vendors is capped by law. Uh, so it never exceeds, I believe the number is somewhere in the 830s. It's been that way for a number of years. No. The licenses? That's right. General vendor licenses. And how many did you say? It's about 830. It's capped by law. 830 for the whole city of New York? That's right. In addition to that, there are, uh, there are licenses that are issued to veterans, which are governed by state law. But the, if someone just wants to come off, of, uh, come off the street and apply for a license and they're not a veteran, that number is around 830. Because I know I have seen um, a large increase of vendors just in my area where you never saw a vendor, they're it, it, all over the place. It's just the number doesn't include food vendors, right? Food vendors No, I'm are talking not, about yeah. food vendors. DCA actually doesn't license food vendors. That's the Department of Health. So we license if you sell goods or services on the streets. That's a general vendor. That was the number we're, we're talking about. But the Department of Health uh, is the one that issues Right. The I, I do know that. Mm -hmm. But Consumer Affairs has some oversight on the vendors. I mean, I just introduced the law that I'm waiting for the Department of Health mm -hmm. to letter grade all the vendors. We can follow up with the Department of Health and, and get that number for you, but because they're not DCA licenses, we don't have them today, but we can, we can get it for you. Look, okay. I, I would, you know, obviously, if we had more resources, we could do even more, right? I'm, 
what I can tell you is that we're always, we're conscious of that, we're, we're conscious of where we're using our resources, and we do try to, to make decisions as to where, where we need to put them, right? And where we see the worst violations, that's where we're going to pri prioritize. Um, but I, I hear you, and yes, um, you know, if there are areas in which you think that we need to be doing more enforcement, we'll be happy to sit down and talk about that. Okay, thank you very much. Along those lines, which fines generate the most revenue for the agency? So I would say it's tobacco, the tobacco retail dealers, violations. Um, that's where we have the highest number of violations and where we issue the most fines. We've actually noticed that there has been a decrease in compliance around the tobacco laws. Is there any reason that you can point to and why that's the case? Meaning that more people are being fined for selling tobacco to minors? I think that there's a number of factors uh, that go into that, and it can be a combination of the turnover in the inspectorate. Uh, so if the minor is either more skilled or less skilled because they've been doing it for longer or less time, then that can result in the, the agency um, undercovering more violations. And in addition, we've been trying to do um, stronger tobacco enforcement, and in some cases that results in more violations because our enforcement practices have been refined and uh, are doing a better job of finding those violations. And uh, our general counsel is reminding me that there's also a lot of business turnover, so there may be new entrants into the market who don't understand the regulations as well and therefore are more likely to violate the law. Has, there, has, there, has the, the fact that the, the smoking age changed in the past few years also played a role into this? Are there still retailers out there that are selling cigarettes to people under the age of 21 or over the age of 18 that you're aware of? We have different units for tobacco 18 and tobacco 21. I don't have the breakout for you for the compliance rate between those two, but we can look into it. Okay. And, and what are the t which licenses actually uh, generate the most revenue that you give out? Uh, again, that really depends on a uh, number of factors because we, our licenses, some of them are one year, some of them are two years. So depending on the year, uh, you'll get a different answer for what, uh, what generates the most revenue. So generally, what, what, is there any one license you can point to and say this license is what um, creates the most revenue for the agency, for the city? Uh, not unequivocally. We'll, we'll look into it more, but for instance, the, the, all, not all license categories are uh, exactly alike. So for sidewalk cafes, there is both a license fee and a consent fee to use the, uh, this public sidewalk for the purpose of a business. And so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of money that's associated with that, that the business pays to the city. Uh, in other categories, there's a relatively low license fee, but a lot of, um, but a lot of people who hold the license. No, they, yeah, but we can go back and, and look into that and give you an answer. I have a question regarding the sidewalk cafes, actually, aside. Mm -hmm. um, does the agency interact with other, with other agencies when it comes to Sidewalk Cafe, for example, maybe DOT or the Parks Department? And the reason I bring this up is because um, a, a restaurant actually reached out to me recently because they received a violation um, because their Sidewalk Cafe uh, application uh, wasn't reflecting uh, the recent work that the Parks Department did on their sidewalk. So, for example, this past year, they were able to have 80 seats out in their sidewalk but the Parks Department planted a tree within that year, and DCA came back and fined the business for not including the tree in their license. Then also, the amount of seating they're now able to put out into the street has dropped to about 15, I believe. So there's been a significant drop in the amount of people able to sit outside and actually be able to uh, gain revenue. Is there, any you know, is there any instances where the agency works with other agencies to talk about sidewalk cafes? So I'd like to circle back on the question that we were just discussing about licensing revenue. We actually did look uh, into this, and in the last two calendar years, 2016 and 2017, the two license categories that produced the most fees collected were secondhand dealer general and home improvement contractor. And we have uh, a significant number of home improvement contractors paying those fees, and as well secondhand dealers, which uh, are all across the city. Okay. 
Hi, I'm Tamala Boyd, General Counsel for DCA. I just wanted to answer your question about whether or not we work with other agencies. Um, Sidewalk Cafe is one of a few licensed categories that are multi-stakeholder uh, categories, and so especially in Sidewalk Cafe, we work very often with parks, uh, the Department of Transportation, um, and we hear a lot about um, things like trees being planted um, after the fact. Um, when we get a complaint like that or when we see a violation like that, that the business is challenging, um, we will always go and talk to parks. We work with them to try and determine uh, why the tree was planted. It's not even always a tree, sometimes it's a bench. Um, and if we can make a determination that the cafe came first, we can sometimes convince parks to remove the tree. Um, often, uh, not often, sometimes, um, by law, the tree can stay. Mm -hmm. In the event that the tree can stay, then we have to work with the business for the business to redo their plans to account for the tree. And sometimes that can result in a reduction in the size of the cafe they're allowed to operate because uh, we always have to account for proper clearances for safety. Have, has DCA ever forgiven any of these fines given to businesses because of the work other agencies have done to the sidewalk um, while they've had the license? I, I cannot imagine that we have not. I mean, my guess would be yes, that we have. I mean, if there was a, an invalidly issued fine because of something that was outside of the control of the business, um, I think that we, we would withdraw that fine. And I can probably find you an example of when that happened. Okay, thank you. Um, speaking of licenses, um, the cabaret law actually re repeal goes into effect in two weeks. Is that going to, how does that change the operations of the agency, if it does at all? Um, we have actually stopped taking applications um, for sidewalk, of course, sorry, I'm still on sidewalk cafes, for cabarets um, and dance halls, and um, we are not doing any enforcement in anticipation of, obviously, the repeal going into effect. And on the outreach side, we did mail all of our existing cabaret licensees to notify them that they'll no longer be required to have that license. And we've updated all the materials on the website so that if a business comes looking to see if they need to apply for a cabaret license, they'll have the right information at their fingertips. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions from my colleagues? So how many total license uh, uh, consumer affairs issue? We license about 81,000 businesses. It, um, it fluctuates depending, again, as with the revenue, it fluctuates depending on uh, where in the year we are because some licenses will turn over, some licenses will expire, but on the whole it's generally around 80,000. That includes both businesses and individuals who have a business such as a home improvement contractor. But, but not, all not all businesses uh, are licensed by DCA though, right? Not all businesses. That's right. Yeah, the department stores, they don't need a license from you, right? No. There are some business, there are a number of businesses that we actually inspect because we regulate them, but they do not have a license from DCA. So, you know, the, the 81,000 is just the number of licensees, but besides that, there are a lot more that we also inspect. So a good example of that would be uh, a bodega or a supermarket. They're not required to get a license from DCA, um, but we would inspect them for compliance with certain ag and markets and weights and measures laws. You, you still go into those ways to check the scales, things like that, right? That's yeah. weights and measures, yeah. yes. Yeah. And as well, uh, we, we, ins we regulate all businesses under the consumer protection law. So that law applies to, uh, to any business. So if you're engaging in deceptive trade practices you, uh, with respect to a consumer, then DCA has authority. Hello? So can you, can you inspect uh, stores? Uh, they are not licensed to sell cigarettes, but they, has, they are selling cigarettes. Yes, we have, as the commissioner mentioned earlier, we have a dedicated tobacco unit that does only tobacco sales. And so it's both the age requirement, packaging and pricing requirements, selling of Lucy's. It's, uh, in, and one of those things is if you're selling without a license, we can inspect you. Because uh, well, uh, recently, they, because uh, the tax uh, increase in cigarettes, in, uh, uh, a lot of consumers are buying uh, cigarettes off, off the, on the streets, you know, not at the legal places. You know. Uh, so uh, I wonder uh, how you can uh, do inspections on those places. Like, like sometimes the uh, bakery stores or, far, or, or even barber shops, they are on the side they selling cigarettes like, from other states. 
because they can make a pretty so good profit from it. Yeah. We, we work together with the Department of Finance and also with the Sheriff's Department in, when we see situations in which there's illegal sale of tobacco and maybe it's not within a, um, like an establishment that we usually visit. So we'd love to hear from you. Um, you know, if you have more information, we can follow up on that. Also, it's uh, Department of Finance, they're doing the enforcement. For it's, um, it's both. So in, in the situation that you're describing where it's not unfolding in the context of a business that we regulate, then uh, we have the ability to partner with the Sheriff's Department within the Department of Finance as well as the NYPD to do uh, appropriate, to take appropriate measures there. But if it's a uh, business, a bodega that doesn't have a license from us and is selling cigarettes or they're taking them out of the pack and selling them as Lucy's, that's something that, that our unit can do. Thank you. Can you tell me how many inspectors do you have in this uh, visiting inspector program? How many staff you have assigned to do this? Three. Hmm? Three. Three. Mm -hmm. so, so all your inspection, is it, um, how many are based on complaint and, and also how many are your regular inspection that you do every year? So let me just say the visiting inspector program is completely separate, right? Because that's not in response to any complaints or it, that is in response to you getting a license from DCA. So you apply for a license and once we grant the license within the first three months, we're going to go out there okay. and give you an educational visit, right? Uh, no violations result from that. And it's a way of making sure that we're welcoming you to the city and we're giving you the tools you need to succeed. In terms of um, complaint inspections and patrol inspections. Do you have numbers? Uh, we don't have numbers today uh, because our inspections can be prompted by a number of different inputs. So one of them is you file a complaint with 311 or on the DCA website. The other is that you are on a uh, regular patrol uh, route. And uh, of course, we'll also receive complaints from council members which will prompt an inspection but we do you know, we have some more data that we can share with you about the inspections themselves. For 2017 we conducted 73,724 inspections so for last year. 73,724. 73, and those are just regular Inspection, not by complaint, or is that including complaint? Well, that, it's all of them. All, it's of them. all of them. So we will have to go and see if we can get numbers on just what were complaints, right? Uh, but that's the total number of inspections. Yeah, I mean, the reason I was asking, because like the, the visitor program, you know, it's great if somebody's starting out. Yeah. But also, people who's been in business, it's also good for them to get a reminder, um, uh, a regular, I mean, not just go there and just give them tickets. Right but to give them a visit and kind of re-educate. Yeah. Are you complying, this is the rules, and, and same thing like what Council Member Ku raised about the stoop line. Yeah. I think it's like, it'd be great to really offer once a year um, to visit these businesses because oftentimes they just don't follow the rules. Um, so I think a reminder right. visit is, is also important. Uh, just a couple of things that we are currently doing um, and we will be happy to partner with you all is that we do business education days so we work closely with a council member and you may propose that we go visit a certain you know a particular set of blocks where there's a lot of commercial activity and we'll go there and do all we do again is we go door to door providing education so it's similar to VIP in the sense that there are no fines issued but it's different because it's not for new licensees it's for existing businesses so we do that we do the business education days and we also have been um, have started doing round tables. So if you have a bid or a merchant association that has particular concerns that they want to bring to our attention, we'll go out there and sit down with them um, and just like hear them out and, and answer their questions. So there are different ways in which we can accommodate that, especially if you have areas that you want us to visit, we'll be happy to do that. Are you doing that also with all the bids in the city? Well, we've done so far, I think only two and we have two more on the calendar for the next few weeks. Um, so I don't know that we have a list of all the bits that we're going through, but we're just mostly working with council members right now. And, and when we do the business education days, which I know that you've done one of, uh, with us, we, all, we try to invite the appropriate uh, bids and merchants associations so that they can come and, and walk with us. 
uh, to visit the businesses and, and teach them about these laws. And those as well uh, are, are not cases where uh, an identified violation would result in a fine. So we can, we can point something out and we can say we, you should fix this before an inspection, but we won't issue a violation at that time. And those we've done, um, uh, we've done lots of them. Uh, we've done more than 20 uh, for the past year. We've visited over 1,800 businesses and we continue to, to actively schedule those both with council members and with merchants associations and bids. Uh, I did wanted to circle back on your question about complaints versus inspections. We can't draw a straight line between these numbers. Uh, from the data we have in front of us today, but as the commissioner mentioned, we did almost 74,000 inspections, and during that same period, we received over 20,000 complaints. So that gives you uh, an idea. And not all those complaints will result in an inspection. Sometimes it's the consumer asking, uh, looking to DCA to help them mediate their complaint, but some of them will. I, I, yeah, I think it's also really good to coordinate more with the bid because they're, they're out there every day cleaning, and they could be the one that I can alert you to where like the stoop line of violations are. Mm -hmm. So this way you have a more closely working relationship with them to educate the, um, you know, the business owner. Um, so this way I think that that could be a more of a regular working relationship. Yeah, we absolutely agree. And I think we view those, those organizations as partners because once we've done a business education day and they've done it with us, then they have a better understanding of our laws and rules and they can continue to educate businesses and serve as a resource for people they have relationships with when they come and say, hey, what is, you know, how do I comply with this DCA law or rule? That bid will already have the tools to uh, either show them what they need to do or point them toward DCA resources that are appropriate. How many, um, how many bilingual staff do you have on site? I mean, on your agency? Um, in terms I, of like uh, the language capability of the agency. Uh, we do have a roster of uh, staff who have volunteered language skills, and we, I don't have that with me today, but we can get it to you. But in terms of language access capability, we, uh, as we mentioned in the presentation, we make that a high priority. We translate uh, all of our commonly used outreach and education materials, and we put them on our website in typically eight to ten different languages. Mm -hmm. And we, we make sure that if there is a targeted piece that is looking for, that is going to a specific community that we translate it for, uh, for that language. And as well, we of course have language line available for all New Yorkers who come in. If, there are, if you come into our licensing center, we have uh, a language access sign uh, that allows them to use language line or to, for the DCA worker to coordinate with one of their coworkers who can communicate in that language. But also our inspectors, right? If they go into a business, they have access to language line on their phones, then they will use the interpretation services as needed. So, I mean, do you also make it a priority to recruit um, inspectors that are bilingual? It's, it's much easier just, <laughs> you know, speak face to face and call up a language line and Um, so definitely that's something that we, we look for and we welcome. I mean, I'm not really sure if like, it, it depend, depending on the title of the, the position we're hiring from, sometimes there are civil service lists and we have to, you know, we have to hire from those lists. But you do, I guess you could do, you could list like prefer, right, to be a, have bilingual ability in different languages and. We, we can and we do, but um, just to reiterate, we are kind of beholden to the civil service system and, and how it works. So we often do say language, you know, preferred or uh, we request it. I mean, Chair, I don't know how it relates to this committee, but I know that there are legislation being introduced to get uh, more information out there about how to apply, um, take the civil service exam, because oftentimes a lot of people don't even know that's available. Um, and that's something that um, we definitely should let the public know so that more people with language ability can apply and get into the system because it just makes, it seems like it just makes the, the work so much better in terms of communicating and, and getting people to understand the rules and regulation if they can do it in the language that they understand. You're absolutely right and I think we should definitely think about ways in which we can make sure people know about how to apply for these jobs for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you.
going back on, on business outreach, we, we noticed in the numbers that there are actually uh, no four months actuals for FY17 and 18. Is there a reason for that? We don't have an answer for you. In the MMR. Yeah, we don't have an answer for, for you today, but let us look into that on our side uh, and, and get back to you as soon as we can. Okay, thank you. Um, is it possible to get a list of all the licensees and fees that the agency? Uh, possible to get a list of? The licenses and fees? Yeah, that's all, of, that's all available on our website, but we can put it together to you, for you yeah, as well. We that'd have, be helpful. Yeah, yeah we have. Um, Many of the fees are set by our rules and are available there, but we'll get you a list of everyone we license and what the fee associated with that is. Thank you. Um, so we also noticed that 21% of the summonses that have been assessed were not paid within the first 120 days, compared with just 8% at the same point last year. Is there any concern from DCA that these fines will not be paid and there might be a, a decrease in revenue for the agency this year? Um, I think that part of that could be that we're now at oath, um, and now that the cases are being heard, there is um, uh, appeal rights, uh, there are default rates, there are, um, uh, as a right, they cap you can vacate a default as a right, and so the process is just extended. Um, and so it, it is very difficult to rely on any number, honestly, that's probably lower than a uh, result of a six month look back period. Um, and in fact, at oath, you have a right to vacate a default for a year. Um, so it could be that that number won't be dependable until a year has passed. So I don't think that we're concerned about that just yet because I think the number is something like 94% of the respondents take advantage of that right to vacate a default? So being that, they, that this has been switched over to oath, now the, the person paying the fine has more rights as to appealing and being able to push when they have to pay these fines? Right, the, so the period in which they have to pay the fine is really extended. Right, right. okay. I mean, I'm done with questions. Is there anything else that we Right, all right, the last question is regarding the revenue estimates. We, we've noticed that uh, this year, you've underestimated your revenues by five to six million dollars compared to what the agency received in 17 and 18. Uh, and also, we also noticed that in the preliminary budgets of 17 and 18, you've also underestimated those revenues as well. Is there a reason for this practice? So DCA works with OMB to estimate those revenues, and we know that they Try, typically try to be conservative because DCA's revenues are uh, vulnerable to shifting based on general economic climate and weather and other factors because, of, because many of our revenues are collected from businesses in the form of license fees or fines. Uh, and so from, to our understanding, it's a choice to be conservative to ensure that, uh, that those factors don't surprise the city. So despite the increase in consumer restitution awarded between last year and this year, there's still a, a decrease from earlier years. Can you explain uh, uh, how are you gonna go back on target to pre-2017 levels? Are you referring to general consumer restitution or paid sick leave restitution? Uh, general. So again, I think this goes back to partially to uh, the growing pains of the oath transition. So we expect that some of these numbers will stabilize as both consumers, businesses, and agency staff get more used to the, uh, the procedures at oath as opposed to the, e the procedures at our old tribunals. But I believe that the four-month um, actual has shown some recovery in, um, in restitution, and we're committed to making sure that it gets back to where we were. We're also working closely with the Mayor's Office of Operations to make sure that the actual MMR metrics better, best capture the work that ECA does and not just, you know, it's not actually affected by processes that are outside of DCA, like oath now, right? 
So hopefully you'll see some of those changes for the next MMR. Okay, we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. Um, I think that's it, right? Well, thanks for testifying. It was great seeing you, Commissioner, and the rest of the team. Um, we'll see each other at the next hearing. Great. You're free to go. Maybe before. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Yeah. I want to call up, uh, we have one witness uh, from the public who would like to testify, uh, Mia, Mia Mikowicz from the Anti-Violence Project. And please forgive me if I mispronounce your name. Sorry, say it again. Yeah, we're, we're about to uh, close the hearing. She's the only person we have testifying. We'll, we'll, we'll keep it open for five minutes. Should we give us time to get here? Is Mia in the house? Awesome. <laughs> Good afternoon. Just state your name for your record before you begin. Thank you. Is the button on? Oh, now it is. Okay, great. Is that better? Oh, Mia Mikovich. Good to go. Good afternoon, Chair Espinal, and thank you to the whole uh, Consumer Affairs Committee for having me and hearing my testimony today. Uh, my name, again, is Mia Mikovich, and I'm the Program Associate in Community Organizing and Public Advocacy at the New York City Anti-Violence Project. I run the volunteer and outreach programs. I coordinate AVP's Pride activities, and I support the organizing department's administrative capacity. In my own role in engaging LGBTQ and HIV-affected survivors through outreach, uh, it's clear that the root causes of violence are not only interpersonal, but they're systemic. This means we need to think about prevention on many levels at once. When I first came to AVP, I didn't identify as a survivor. I just knew that I wanted to give back. As a queer, transgender person working in film and television at the time, I was struggling with long gaps of unemployment, depression, discouragement, and felt isolated from others like myself. The more I learned volunteering at AVP, the more I began to feel connected to my community and empowered to educate myself about the violence that my community had endured and that I had also experienced but hadn't yet given a name to. The people I met through AVP and the organizations that we partner with changed me. There are so many survivors in New York City who deserve the opportunity to connect with their community who are being cut off, either because of the fear, isolation, and threats by their abusive, uh, violent partners, the denial of their identities by service providers and also often their own families, and the constant barrage of sexual harassment and other violations of their boundaries. 
The Anti-Violence Project's programs include a 24-hour Spanish-English crisis intervention hotline with calls going up 34% um, in fiscal year 2017 over the previous fiscal year. That reflects the turbulent times impacting LGBTQ communities. Um, some of our other programming includes one-on-one -on -one counseling with support groups, reaching over 1,100 community members in all five boroughs, uh, our economic empowerment program, which includes tax workshops, credit and debt, resumes and cover letters, AVP's legal services, representing survivors in all civil legal matters, including immigration, family, housing, and public benefits. We have seen a 24% increase in overall clients seeking legal services since the 2016 election. Um, our leadership development program includes job readiness and paid internship, like the Speakers Bureau is one workshop we do, and there's a bunch more. Community organizing, um, outreach and education, um, activities that have reached more than 43,000 people just in the last year in all five boroughs, again, with information about staying safe, which includes bystander intervention trainings, know your rights trainings, um, and much more. Uh, we also do policy advocacy work with the city council on uh, community forums and policy solutions to violence. I respectfully ask that you continue to, uh, that the, the New York City Council uh, continues your support of AVP and that the committee work with us on these issues so that New York City can become a safer place for LGBTQ and HIV affected communities where we can thrive. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Mia, just a quick question. Do you do, you do any work with, with the Department of Consumer Affairs? Do you interact with the agency at all? Um, we do, yes. Mostly our client services department, but sometimes we, we uh, collaborate for outreach events, yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Noted. Appreciate it. Of course. Have a good too. weekend. You too. Thank you. Okay. With that said, this meeting uh, has uh, come to its conclusion and adjourned. Thank you.